Jeffrey Stanton. I've been trying to get <coughs> Professor Stanton here for a while. Uh, he's really a leader in this area of um, the study of genocide and genocide prevention now. Uh, he's working with a group of scholars internationally on this very serious uh, subject. Today, Professor Stanton will speak at the title of his lecture is Iran's Anti-Jewish Incitement to Genocide Against Israel is the West Asleep Again. Professor Stanton is a research professor of genocide studies and, and prevention at the Institute for Conflict Analysis and Resolution at George Mason University in Virginia. He's also the founder and president of uh, Genocide Watch. Some of you have some of the pamphlets from his organization. He's also the founder and director of the Cambodian Genocide Project and the founder and chair of the International Campaign to End Genocide. Uh, before being a professor at George Mason University, some of the things that Professor Stanton has done. Uh, he served at the U.S. State Department um, in the United States, in Washington, where he drafted, uh, helped to draft the U.N. Nations Security Council resolution that was created, um, that created the International Criminal Tribunal uh, for Rwanda. He was a faculty at the Salzburg Global Seminar Fellowship meeting on preventing genocide and mass violence and what could be learned from history. He was a volunteer in the Peace Corps, the U.S. Peace Corps in, in Cote d'Ivoire and the Ivory Coast. And he was a law professor at Washington uh, and Lee University, the American University and the University of Swaziland. He studied at Oberlin College, at the Harvard Divinity School, he graduated from Yale Law School, and he did his doctorate in cultural anthropology at the University of Chicago. He's been a fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. And I can spend another 20 minutes introducing your, your accomplishments. But I think it's, uh, we will come to the seminar. And Professor Stanton has really been uh, a leading expert in uh, some engaging this issue of Iran, which ultimately was the, the issue that brought me to the work that I'm trying to do. As always, it's great to be back to Yale. I love this place. Mm -hmm. uh, I fell in love with it when I was in law school. And uh, my wife was a professor of nursing over at the nursing school, so we have a very strong tie to Yale. Um, I We'll say one thing, and that is, you know, you heard all these various, this parade of degrees and stuff like this. The problem with that all was that I was, I would never attend any graduation ceremonies because I was often, always on to the next thing. You know, I was always off to Africa or something. And, uh, but for the law school uh, graduation from Yale Law School, she told me, this is my wife, she said, you are going to this graduation ceremony because you are not going to medical school next. <laughs> <laughs> so, I uh, have been very lucky because I went to a law school that didn't just see law as uh, kind of a course for mechanics who were trying to make uh, already built um, automobiles and trucks work. It was also a law school for people who designed the trucks and the cars and all of the other kinds of things that we need to make a working legal system. It was a place, if you will, where precedent was not considered absolute. And if there wasn't any international criminal law, then by golly, you better invent it. And that was basically the attitude of this school. And I, when I studied here with Mirjan Damaska in international criminal law, the, the last real, um, the, the last real um, um, monument in international criminal law were the Nuremberg Tribunals, right after World War II. There essentially had not been much international criminal law after that. And I had, while I was here, um, been asked to go to Cambodia by a consortium of American agencies. Uh, at first I resisted, by the way, 
I said, you know, it's time for me to finish my education and please find someone else. And they did. And the guy burned out after six weeks. Uh, and this is after he'd been the director for this program in Haiti. This is how tough it was in Cambodia. But anyway, they finally came back to me and said, we want you because we think you can speak French, understand communism, you know, you lived in Asia and all the other good reasons that my <laughs> former Oberlin roommate used to uh, put a hammer lock on me to get me to go. Uh, and I said, one condition, my wife comes with me. He says, oh, I don't know that we can do that. Because none of the other organizations are letting that happen. You know, it's too dangerous out there. Got Khmer Rouge running around having machine gun battles, you know, in the middle of Phnom Penh and everything else. Uh, I said, sorry, I know where my strength is. And it isn't just in the Lord. Uh, even though that is, of course, where I finally find my strength. Um, so she came out, and uh, we worked in the uh, relief program there in Cambodia, and it was the first time I'd ever seen a genocide. Um, I thought I'd been called to go out there, you know, to set up a relief program. What I didn't know was that I'd also been called out to discover my calling my destiny. It's a really old, old, Old Testament term, call it. But that's exactly what it was. I knew exactly after that that the rest of my life I had to defend, I had to devote to the prevention and punishment of genocide. Because the Genocide Convention had been law since the early 1950s, and yet no one had ever been prosecuted under it. No one. And here, in Cambodia, we had two million deaths out of a population of eight million. If there was ever a case where you should have been applying the Genocide Convention and laws against crimes against humanity, this was the case. And, and yet the Khmer Rouge were up along the Thai border and they were getting away with mass murder. And when we came back, we had just adopted our daughter who was the very first Cambodian baby that that government allowed a foreigner to adopt. I can tell you the rest of the story, but we don't have time. Um, and I should have been the happiest person in the world. I got back, however, and I was totally depressed. And I realize now, I look back on it, that I had post-traumatic stress disorder. I mean. And I'd walk through all these mass graves, I'd talk to all these survivors about their experiences and so forth. They hadn't even named post-traumatic <coughs> stress disorder at that point. But I fortunately was directed to go down here to the Yale Health Service and saw a psychiatrist for the first time in my life. And the psychiatrist said to me, son, if you weren't depressed, there'd be something wrong with you. After what you've seen, he said, Depression, this is very wise advice that I've never forgotten. Depression is repressed anger. What are you angry about? I said, I am mad as hell that the Khmer Rouge had gotten away with mass murder. And he looked me in the eye and he said, what are you going to do about it? Now you talk about a call, that was it. And I said, well, you know, it's occurred to me that we need to bring them to justice somehow. And at that time, the only place to do it was the International Court of Justice in The Hague. Um, it wouldn't have been perfect because it was state versus state. It wasn't individual trials and so forth. Um, but nevertheless, it could have been a way to lay out the facts and you know, really uh, condemn the regime. Um, the, I went around to all the human rights groups, and not one of them would touch it. Not one. Human Rights Watch, Amnesty, you know, beyond our mandates at Amnesty. I mean, you name it, none of them would touch it. And I finally, I came back here to Mars McDougall and Mike Reesman, who were my uh, mentors here at the law school in international law. And I remember that uh, 
Mars McDougall said to me, uh, well, why don't you do it? And I don't know if any of you knew him, but uh, he was a pretty powerful guy. And uh, I said, but I'm just a law student. And he said, yes, but you're a Yale law student. <laughs> now I know that that was the absolute height of Ivy League arrogance, but it gave me this kind of yes, you can do it, kind of a approach to this thing that really was wonderful. It was empowering. And I've tried to do that for my students ever since. I don't use that same line, obviously. But I've, but I've told my students at Mary Washington University, don't wait until you're out of school. You can start changing the world now. And some of them have. One, for instance, started an organization called Students Helping Honduras that in the four years he was an undergraduate raised three million dollars to rebuild an orphanage and an entire <coughs> village in Honduras. And the organization still there. I mean, young people today uh, are a remarkable group of people. Uh, and I uh, was fortunate that I had the same kind of encouragement from my teachers here. So, a lifetime then spent working on genocide and especially, of course, the Cambodian genocide, and it's a great, uh, a great uh, sense of satisfaction with which I now see that the Khmer Rouge are being tried for those crimes. Um, and uh, even though it's only a few of them that will be tried, the facts will be laid out and there will be um, some justice done. And I can tell you that most of the people in Cambodia are very, in, very much in favor of these trials. Um, so, and I wrote the rules for that uh, tribunal. Um, but I want to talk to you right now about genocide prevention, because that has really become the main focus of my work. Over the last few years, I've been rethinking genocide prevention and realizing that setting up tribunals is just a little too late. It's after the genocide's already happened. And the whole idea of general deterrence, you know, that by setting up the tribunals that somehow you'll deter the Charles Taylors and the Slobodan Milosevic's of the world from committing genocide, well, it's a little weak as a theory. Uh, if it, if, if the laws against murder were deterrence against murder, I guess we wouldn't have any murders, would we? The truth is, we need more than that. We need preventive measures. We need to create cultures that are anti-genocidal. We need to create cultures that are anti-homicidal, also for that matter. I mean, we have a whole job of prevention that comes way before um, punishment. And um, that is what I've been rethinking and trying to figure out, well, what do we need to do to stop and prevent genocide? I want to talk to you today about a very serious threat to, in my view, the entire world. And that is <coughs> the nation of Iran. And I don't mean to be anti-Iranian because I believe that Iran has a very great historical uh, tradition. And I think the people of Iran, uh, a lot of the people of Iran are sick of their government and would lo love to overthrow it. I think that if you really gave free elections a chance in Iran, they would be voted out of power. But it didn't happen in this last election. It'll take some time. But I, I know it can happen. The reason I know it can happen is because I was one of the people involved uh, in the movement to overthrow the Soviet Union also. I was the legal advisor to RUP, which was the independence movement in Ukraine. We knew that Ukraine was the linchpin of the Soviet Union. If you could get Ukraine to declare independence, the whole system would fall apart. And that's exactly what, of course, what happened. Um, The question is, what do we do now about the threat of Iran? 
And I want to make some comparisons which are really rather disturbing. What I want to do is directly compare statements made by the leadership of Iran with statements made by Adolf Hitler in my camp. Now I am sure you know how these, this used to always be the sort of the, you know, the, cr the crushing blow in any debate, you know, you, you, you gave some long quote, you know, and then at the end of it you'd pause, you know, and then you'd say, that was said by Adolf Hitler, you know, and, and, and people would say, oh my God, you know, we don't want to follow that advice. But the truth is, Hitler was very clear about what he intended in Mein Kampf. The world should never have been surprised about what he did. He laid it all out. And if you, and I have, read, reread Mein Kampf and gone through it uh, in some detail, it is really quite striking. Now the other thing that I want, I want to put this in a framework because I have concluded after studying many, many genocides that there's a pattern to genocide. It isn't you know, just some kind of accident. It doesn't just happen. Um, it is a, there's a predictable set of uh, uh, transformations or operations that occur in genocide. I call them stages. And it's, I call them the eight stages of genocide. I don't mean them to be linear stages that, you know, first you have one and then secondly, the second and the third and so forth. But in terms of logic, they're helpful for us to break down the genocidal process so we can understand what's going on in the genocidal process. Because the truth is, these stages are often all working together at the same time. But it's still useful, I think, analytically, to break them down and see what's going on. Because all of them are necessary for genocide. The first stage is classification. You can't have a genocide unless you can classify people into us and them. Now this is a normal thing for people to do. Of course they classify people into us versus them. It's not necessarily a step towards genocide that we consider ourselves Americans and you know people who are from, I don't know, Bulgaria are Bulgarians. That's normal. I mean people do classify. Um, I, you know, I'm sure that in this group here, uh, it would not be very hard for us to uh, classify who is women and who is men also. I mean, we classify, although there are, as you know, certain uh, quarrels now about just how definite some of those classifications are. But uh, without classification, you can't have genocide. So the question then is, is it possible for you to have classifications in which you literally classify an entire group outside the human race? In both cases, in Hitler's case and in the Iranian regime's case, that is exactly what has happened. I want to read to you from Mein Kampf. Jews in their very existence are an incarnate denial of the beauty of God's image in his creation. In other words, they really aren't human. He goes on. He talks about the, uh, in Hitler goes on, he says, Finally, he, he, this in my <coughs> comp, he's, you know, it's, it, the development of his thought about his, his, his awakening to, the, to this terrible <coughs> plot of Jews to take over the world and so forth. I was happy at last to know for certain that the Jew is not a German. Thus, I finally discovered who were the evil spirits leading our people astray. And he also talked about uh, the... Uh, the classification of Jews in, um, in, in terms of their um, being not only Jews, but also Zionists. He equated the two terms. He said, 
the liberal Jews who, who argued with the Zionists, it was really a false game. They were really all Zionists. Okay, well, let's take a look at what uh, we see here in uh, Iran, because in Iran, we have some very interesting statements. This is a statement by President Ahmadinejad on August 1st, 2006. This is about Jews. They have no boundaries, limits, or taboos when it comes to killing <coughs> human beings. Who are they? Where did they come from? Are they human beings? That's a quote. Then he goes on and he says, they are like cattle, no more mis misguided, a bunch of bloodthirsty barbarians. Next to them, all the criminals of the world seem righteous. These are quotes from the president of Iran. Um, and, you know, one of the interesting things about this is you can trace these quotes, not just to him, you can trace them all the way back to the beginning of the uh, Islamic Republic 30 years ago. Uh, I'm just going to be doing quotes from the past 10 years, uh, but uh, it's been from the start. And in fact, uh, the Ayatollah Khomeini himself was one of the most uh, anti-Jewish of all of the uh, Iranian leaders. The second step in genocide or stage is called symbolization. We have to somehow name the groups. Or we put symbols on them. The most famous symbol, of course, is the Nazi yellow star. Uh, in Cambodia, they made the peace for people in the eastern zone wear blue and white check scarves to identify them as a group to be, to be uh, eliminated when they sent them up river. This step of uh, of symbolization is something that's really quite easy in both of these cases because um, Jews in, um, in Germany uh, frequently wore, uh, some of the Hasidic Jews wore different kinds of dress. Uh, many spoke Yiddish in Eastern Europe. Uh, there were ways in which to identify Jews through their ceremonies. They went to synagogues and so forth. In other words, the symbolic aspect of Judaism was very obvious in the Holocaust. Uh, that also is the case, of course, with Israel, because there you have people who literally formed their own country and have identified it as a Jewish uh, state. And so you, his, his enemy, Israel, uh, has been identified symbolically by uh, citizenship, nationality in the Israeli state. The third stage, and this is the one that really, I think, is overwhelming in both cases, is dehumanization. Because dehumanization is really where the downward spiral of genocide begins. I want to now read to you some of the statements of Hitler um, about Jews. Was there any shady undertaking, any form of foulness, especially in cultural life, in which at least one Jew did not participate? On putting the probing knife carefully to that kind of abscess, one immediately discovered, like a maggot in a putrescent body, a little Jew who was often blinded by the sudden light. It's page 42 of my account. Um, They looked upon, they, they are a public danger comparable only to the plague. In other words, we see uh, lots of imagery in which uh, groups that are targeted for genocide um, are identified with uh, a disease uh, or with some kind of uh, uh, evil. Here's another one. The Jew is pictured as the incarnation of Satan and the symbol of evil. This is all in Hitler's Mein Kampf. Um, another common um, image is of the parasite. Systematically, these Negroid parasites in our national body corrupt our innocent, fair-haired girls. Um, they're often characterized as dirty or 
filthy. Um, all these negative things. Um, cleanliness uh, is foreign to the Jew. They're water shy. The odor of these people in caftans often used to make me feel ill. Beneath their unclean exterior, one suddenly perceived the moral mildew of the cho chosen race. And he would, he could, he would, I can keep going on and on and on with these kinds of, of images. Here was a pestilence, a moral pestilence, with which the public was being infected. It was worse than the Black Plague of long ago. Acting like a sewage pump, these fellows would shoot his filth directly in the face of other members of the human race. They are the worst kind of germ carriers in poisoning human souls. And not only that, they're contagious. Nine-tenths of all of the smutty literature, artistic tripe, theatrical banalities, had to be charged the account of people who formed scarcely 1% of the nation. And then he starts to investigate the Jewish press, which he says is, is uh, uh, responsible for this, this uh, contagion. Also that Jews played a social, a huge role in prostitution, especially the white slave traffic. Um, He talks often about how Jews are a cancer, a cancer in the body politic. Um, that, uh, he, and he talks about them being parasitic. Uh, here's a here's a very here's a classic one. He talks about this is after the beginning of World War One. Uh, government offices were staffed by Jews. Almost every clerk was a Jew, and every Jew was a clerk. I was amazed at this multitude of combatants who belonged to the chosen people and could not help comparing it with their slender numbers in the fighting lines. In the business world, the situation was even worse. Here, the Jews had actually become indispensable. Like leeches, they were slowly sucking the blood from the pores of the national body. Um, so these sorts of um, dehumanizing uh, messages are, you know, very common. You'll you'll see he talks about them being like rats, uh, and uh, he <coughs> denigrates Jewish culture. He says there has never been any Jewish art. The Jew has done no original creative work. It's just amazing, really, when you start reading Mein Kampf. He lays it all out. Um, okay, now let's compare it to um, Iran. Um, this is a, these are statements, and I'll just brief, brief, briefly give you um, some of them. This is by uh, Raf, Raf Sanjani uh, in December 2000. One day, this tumor will be removed from the body of the Islamic world. And I go on to quote later in that statement what he said. The employment of even one atomic bomb inside Israel will wipe it off the face of the earth. But such a bomb would only do damage in the Islamic world. Does that uh, maybe scare you a little bit when you think about it? It should. It certainly should. Remember that at the time Hitler was writing Mein Kampf, he was, he was in prison still. He didn't even have, you know, he wasn't head of state yet. Well, these guys have taken over the state in Iran, and they have already put together a, uh, a, a complete program to develop nuclear weapons. And don't, it, don't believe it when people say that they aren't to develop nuclear weapons. Of course they are. Here we have um, some more of these images. The cancerous tumor called Israel must be uprooted from the region. That's Ali Khamenei, who's one of the top religious leaders in Iran. Uh, here's Mohammed Khatami, supposedly a moderate. Zionism has turned the holy religion of Moses into a game of its satanic desires. Um, again, Ali Khamenei uh, talks about uh, 
Many of the problems of the Islamic world result from the presence of the cancerous tumor in the body of the Islamic world, the Zionist regime. And this, this sort of theme of the, uh, of the cancer continues on throughout you know, the kinds of discourse that you find in Iran. Amman Nijad talks about, um, and here's the most famous statement of all, of which I'm sure all of you are aware. October 25th, 2005, Ahmad Nijad said, Imam Khomeini has said that the occupying regime must be wiped off the map. And this was a very wise statement. That was the famous statement in which he said Israel should be wiped off the map. The world, needless to say, had a rather intense reaction to that. Uh, it was an intense reaction, especially after they literally painted it on the side of some of the missiles that they had built and had a military parade a few weeks later in which they said, Israel will be wiped off the face of the earth. I mean, you can't get very much more you know, graphic than that. Uh, and I have had arguments, I will tell you that they were arguments, with Sarah Lee Whitman from Human Rights Watch in which she says, what is this hang-up you've got about Iran? And she says, you know, don't you know that that was a mistranslation? Uh, and I said, no, it wasn't. We've actually had people who speak fluent Parsi who have taken the Parsi and have translated it. And there is no question what he's saying. He means wiped off the face of the map, physically. And he's not just talking about a Zionist form of government either. He's talking about a state, a nation. Now, when you wipe a state or a nation off the face of the map, that's called genocide. Um, so here he is, and he, it's repeated again and again. And I won't bore you with all of the many repetitions. Uh, here is Ahmad Nijad again. He says the Zionist regime is heading toward annihilation. This is 2006. The Zionist regime is a rotten dry tree that will be eliminated in one storm. We also have, of course, um, the, uh, the equality with uh, the plague and with typhus and so forth that Hitler used in his imagery. Um, we have um, uh, these statements about cancer, about uh, bloodthirsty uh, barbarians and so forth, satanic uh, Zionists, a regime based on evil. Um, now, this I am taking from an extraordinary <coughs> document that's been put together uh, by the Genocide Prevention Now um, group at uh, uh, the Institute on the Holocaust and Genocide in Jerusalem, uh, led by uh, Elihu Richter, Professor Israel Charney, and uh, prepared by uh, uh, Yale Stein, who's a doctor and an MD, uh, Tamara Pelleggi and Alex Barnea. Uh, this is on our website, on the Genocide web website, and it's also on the Genocide Now. Uh, it's genocidepreventionnow.org is also, it's on their website. It's got all these statements, very carefully cataloged, completely sourced. You can find out exactly where you can find every single one of these statements. You know, this was in such and such a Iranian newspaper on such and such a date and so forth. Very carefully, very well done scholarship. Okay, now let's take a look at four, because four is the place where you have to have organization. Organization is the fourth stage. Without four, you can't really do a genocide. You gotta have somebody to carry it out. Um, and so people normally will train militias or a SS or an army or somebody to, an Einsatzgruppen group to actually carry out the killings. The Interahamwe in Rwanda. Um, in this case, of course, when Hitler wrote Mein Kampf, he didn't have the organization yet. So 
So he doesn't write much about that in Mein Kampf. But of course, we know later that he very he had a very powerful organization that he organized uh, and that was uh, headed by the SS and the Gestapo. Uh, but uh, in this case, uh, in the uh, Iranian case, we've got the Revolutionary Guards, who uh, are very clearly the central organization that is the key to uh, carrying out this uh, campaign of genocide uh, in, uh, against uh, Israel. And they're not exactly subtle about what they say. Um, Here we have, for example, one of the uh, one of the statements about their capabilities. I'm just just looking quickly for that. They said, uh, and let me, by the way, on the on the side while I'm searching for that, um, note that they they see other countries. Um, as being powerless to stop um, the Zionists, the Israel, the, the Israel, because they believe, firmly believe, just the way Hitler did, that the Zionists actually control the governments and the financial institutions in European and U.S. Uh, countries. In other words, that behind the scenes, these puppet masters are actually making the U.S. government and the European governments do what they do. And one of the most chilling things recently in interviews that I've heard on TV with um, uh, uh, many of you, John, is that uh, I heard this with Diane Sawyer. Uh, he started give, coming out with this theory that it's really the Zionists who are running everything. It's almost as like he was, it's almost like he he has reread Mein Kampf. You know, it's it's these people get more and more sophisticated. And one of the things we've learned about genocide is that people who are planning a genocide uh, read about previous ones. They learn from them. <coughs> Do you know what we found in the library of Javier Mana in Rwanda? president of Rwanda, his wife was one of the main planners of the genocide, a translation of Mein Kampf into Kenya, Rwanda. You know, genocide is, it, it's not a, uh, an accident. Uh, here, here's the statement that I was looking for. This is a brag. You know, this is, here, here we got uh, Amanujad, uh, bragging about their capabilities. He says, Iran currently has over 12,000 centrifuges in operation, and the Zionist regime has no answer to our Sajil-2 missile. The Sajil-2 missile is the one that's designed so it can hit Israel. And they have a lot of them. So, um, you know, there you've got essentially the, the creation of the capability, that's the organization stage, to carry out the genocide. The fifth stage is polarization, in which it's us versus them, in which you try to drive all the moderates out. That's exactly, by the way, why it was so important for Ahmadinejad and the uh, religious uh, leaders of Iran to crush the opposition right after this uh, most recent election in Iran because those are the moderates who could have stopped this genocidal uh, trend. Um, the first people to be uh, killed in any genocide are always the moderates from the group that's doing the killing. Um, in other words, the first people who were killed in Rwanda were moderate Hutus. The president of the Supreme Court was a friend of mine, by the way. Uh, the prime minister, these were moderate Hutus, not Tutsis. Uh, the reason why they're killed first, and it's the first people that Hitler arrested, uh, were uh, leaders of the Social Democratic Party, leaders of the Communist Party, liberal priests, Germans. You know, these were not Jews. Then they moved on to Jews. But they first had to get, get the moderates out of the way. And that's exactly what's happening in Iran right now. 
Um, so we've got stage five already already underway. Stage six is essentially preparation. It's when you uh, confiscate the property of the victim group. Uh, it's when you um, you make the preparations for the genocide. Um, and that is, I'm afraid, where we are with Iran right now. Uh, Iran is preparing. It's getting ready. Uh, it's why they are trying to create the nuclear weapons. And the preparation stage in, in other genocides may be things as, you know, like, as simple as, as handing out machetes to, uh, you know, groups of people who are going to do the killing and training the inter way to do it. Uh, or it may be as complicated and complex as building concentration camps and, uh, and, and death camps, the way the Nazis did. That's one of the most technologically sophisticated of all genocides. Uh, <coughs> but uh, what we've got, of course, in Iran is they are literally preparing uh, the, the bomb. <coughs> and of all weapons, the nuclear weapons are the most uh, genocidal of all weapons. So the question is, what do we do about this? German Chancellor Angela Merkel was the first world leader to recognize the connection between <coughs> Iran's uranium enrichment, its testing of long distance missiles, and the genocidal statements of its president, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. Uh, and as I've just proven to you, these statements didn't begin with him. They go way back. Um, <coughs> day after he had declared that Israel should be wiped off the map, uh, and he, he had had a rally in which he'd incited students to scream death to Israel at a government-sponsored conference called World Without Zionism. Uh, and Chancellor Merkel's immediate response was a president that questions Israel's right to exist and denies the Holocaust. And oh, that's the, that's the eighth stage, by the way, of genocide. The seventh stage of genocide is the actual killing. It's the actual genocide. The eighth stage is denial. It's a continuation of the genocide because it's a continuation of the effort to destroy the group. It's why you still have Holocaust deniers. It's still why the Turkish regime is denying the Armenian genocide. It's a continuation of genocide. But here we got it. Iran, Ahmadinejad, denies that the Holocaust happened. It's astonishing. But it's part of his uh, ideology. But here he, here, here he is, a Holocaust denier cannot expect to receive any tolerance from Germany. <coughs> and this I underline, we have learned our history. That's Chancellor Merkel. Merkel. The question I want to ask us is, will her warnings of the parallels between Iran's actions today and Nazi Germany's first steps towards genocide in the 1930s prod the world into effective deterrent action? In October 2005, the UN Security Council condemned the words of the Iranian president, and the Security Council issued a press statement, which is the weakest form of expression I know because I've written some of those. It was still a diplomatic defeat, nevertheless, for Iran. And the ante keeps going up. We've gotten more and stronger sanctions each time in the resolution. Nevertheless, Iran is still developing its nukes. And its leadership hasn't changed these apocalyptic views. We wrote in uh, February 2006, the International Association of Genocide Scholars. At that time, I was first vice president, and then I later became president of it, uh, and passed a resolution noting that Iran's actions, including his uh, Manijai's statements, were early warning signs of genocide. And because they included, and the, I underline, open expressions of an exclusionary ideology characterized by hate speech, 
an authoritarian government that repressed dissent. You realize that they've had 100,000 executions in Iran since the time of the Iranian Revolution. The only country that's close is China. The organization of fanatical militias such as the Revolutionary Guards and a sustained record of support for terror attacks against Jews around the world, especially through Hezbollah, Hamas, and other groups. Iran was behind the bombing of the, of the synagogue in uh, Buenos Aires. They've proven it. Indifference to incitement and inaction by the outside world, most notably in the UN itself, are other warning signs because you can't have a genocide unless you have the guilty bystander. And the more we've researched bystanders, why it is that we will stand by and watch another Darfur happen, for instance, uh, or a Rwanda, the more we've come to a very, very troubling conclusion. And this is the result of, a, uh, of the work of a social psychologist out at the University of Oregon uh, named Slovik, who uh, has, I think, conclusively proven that people respond far more intensely to the suffering of one or two people than they will to 10,000 or 50,000. As Stalin put it, and he was, Stalin was a genius, even though he was an evil genius, he said, one death is a tragedy, a million is a statistic. And that is, in truth, the way we are programmed. It's the way our minds are programmed. And, you know, I mean, there's lots of theories about why that is. It may be that it is because we've grown up in small groups during our evolution. Uh, it may be because we do respond, after all, personally, uh, far more readily to someone that we can identify. But they've even done studies in which they um, have, have had, among the people who have been tested, they will ask them, they will, um, they will have some kind of sweepstakes and each of them wins a certain amount of money and then they'll say, okay, now you can donate uh, $5 to help out uh, this girl who is living in Niger and starving to death and if you give the $5, that will go directly to feed her. Uh, will you give the money? And you had, you know, well over 50% of the people say yes. When they divided it between this girl and Musa, who was a young boy who was also living in Niger or someplace like that, and said, okay, now if you give this $5 to, the, uh, to our fund, we will feed both Musa and uh, you know, Kitu, uh, the amount given actually went down. And when you said, if you give the five dollars, we will give it so that it will go to an organization that is feeding literally hundreds of thousands of people out in the Sahel region of West Africa. You know what the, the response rate was? It went down to less than 20%. Uh, it's, there is a distancing that occurs in us and is a, he calls it um, um, a, uh, a psychic numbing that seems to be part of what, of, of what is built into us as human beings. So the question he, and he then addresses, well, how do we get over this? And he says, well, there's two ways we react to things. One is a kind of emotional way an effective way. And we're much more likely to respond if we have that kind of a response. And then there's a rational or analytic way, you know, when you hear the statistics and so forth. Maybe a little less likely to respond that way, but it also is a way to think that is helps us to strategically plan what we'll do. Uh, one of my heroes in the 
is uh, Nick Kristof, who uh, wrote a very, very famous um, uh, column in the New York Times, an op-ed, called The Darfur Puppy. Maybe some of you read it. He pointed out that uh, more money had been spent uh, rescuing a dog off of a uh, boat that was off of Hawaii that had somehow got stranded on a, on a boat that had been abandoned. More money had been spent rescuing that dog than had been spent to save the lives of literally tens of thousands of people in Darfur during that same time. Uh, you know, he says, maybe what we need is a Darfur puppy. We need to find a puppy who can represent the people of Darfur, and we'll talk about how terribly, how terribly uh, th this puppy's doing, how he's starving to death, and if you'll just give some money, we will save it. It was, of course, brilliant. I mean, it was tongue-in-cheek, but he was basically saying, we need somehow to have that kind of personal connection. And I used to tell my students, one of my, uh, one of my, uh, when I taught my introduction to genocide course, I never had them write research papers. I had them write papers just like they'd have to write if they were a uh, political uh, uh, aid to the uh, ambassador uh, of the United States in uh, Berlin in 1938, or uh, Constantinople in 1915, or if they were a desk officer in the United States State Department you know, just before the Rwandan genocide, or and I had them do a, an op-ed piece just before, say, the Darfur, or during the Darfur genocide. For the model for the op-ed pieces, I always said, look at Kristoff. He starts off every one of his op-eds, I mean, there are exceptions to this, but almost every one with a story. He tells you about a person, and then from that, he develops his point. And I've talked to him about it. He says, oh, I know why. That's exactly what I do. And, um, and I said, you know, my dad was a preacher. And that's what my dad said to do also. He says, every good preacher knows that too. If you want to reach people, you tell them a story. Uh, so anyway, uh, these are ways in which, of course, we've somehow got to make people understand the danger that we're currently in. Now, what we've got here is a covert nuclear weapons program, long-range missiles, and a leader who declares genocidal intent against a state that he can attack and that he has denounced as being somehow less than human. Um, so the question is, you know, what do we do? Genocide is one of the toughest nuts to crack. It's, it killed more than 100 million people in the 20th century. That's more than all the wars combined. Uh, a lot of people have no idea that it's that serious. Um, it isn't an accident, as I've just tried to show you. Uh, its main, its main place where you can stop it, we are convinced now, is in the incitement. Because incitement to commit genocide is actually a crime under the Genocide Convention. You don't have to prove that the person actually committed the genocide. If the person is calling for the genocide, as you have just been studying the media case, the media trial, and the Rwandan genocide. The genocide doesn't even have to happen for the person to be put on trial for inciting others to commit it. Of course, in the case of the media trial in uh, Rwanda, uh, the newspaper, Kangura, and the radio station, uh, the uh, radio station in Rwanda that was literally giving orders to people to track down a car full of Tootsies who were going down such and such a road and, and stop it and haul them out of the car and slaughter them. I mean, that was very clearly incitement because incitement essentially follows what you can call the um, uh, clear and present days, danger test. The difference between hate speech, where you say, oh, I hate all Jews, 
and clear and present danger test is, I hate all Jews, and that Jew over there, you really should murder him. That's the danger. That's the, that's the incitement. Incitement is where you connect it up to the likelihood of a crime. And in fact, of course, in the case of the Rwandan genocide, the, the crime was actually going on at the time. So these people were convicted. Well, I'm convinced that that is exactly what's happening in, in Iran right now. They are preparing for genocide. Now, people will say, oh, golly, do you really think so? Do you really think so? I mean, and I ask you, just read Mein Kampf and ask yourself if you really think that Hitler intended to do what he did. He wrote it all down, and then he did it. Now, a wonderful book about this, by the way, one I heartily recommend that you reread if you haven't read it before, is John F. Kennedy's senior thesis in 1940 at Harvard called Why England Slept. I, of course, for me, John F. Kennedy was what got me into American politics. <coughs> he was my hero. He was elected my freshman year in high school. I remember running around my Republican town in Illinois campaigning for him, and I was a Protestant pastor's son, and all of, all of, my, uh, all of his colleagues, you know, in the ministerial profession were saying, what on earth is your son going on around the campaign for a Catholic for, you know, things like this. But, you know, Kennedy had this kind of charisma that really got you to, to, to do things. He, he had a genius. And it wasn't only after he became president. He saw that what had happened in England before the First World War, before the Second World War, was also something that we should learn from. Because the US had been part of that, I would say, self-denial of what had happened, or what was happening in Germany. We had a lot of isolationists, didn't want to do a thing. Uh, about the buildup uh, in Germany. Germany was clearly building up its military. Uh, Hitler was making all these statements. Um, and yet we didn't really take it seriously. And the same thing happened in England. And that was what was so amazing. Why would it happen in England when they were just across the channel? He concluded the major reason was that in England, a pacifist movement had basically taken control of the political parties. And that England wanted no more to do with war. They had concluded that the First World War was total folly. And it certainly was. It was you, know, you had to take all of history back, you know, and start over again at some point, I would say, let's take back the First World War, because I think a lot of the disasters since if you can trace them to that. But the English had said, enough. We don't want anything more with war. And they'd also been, they had been educated to believe that it was the arms manufacturers that caused wars. So let's not make arms. Let's not get ready. Let's not build up the Navy. You know, let's not be ready. And so they weren't. And so when uh, the Germans had built up their enormous forces, the Wehrmacht, the, the tank battalions, and everything else, and just plain rolled across Europe, the British weren't ready. Um, but what I'm convinced is we have got to find ways for uh, to be ready for Iran, because I think Iran is about to act. Um, the ethical principle under which we're acting here is what's called the responsibility to protect. Uh, it means that if a country is violating the rights of its own citizens, the international community has a duty to actually step in to protect those rights. It doesn't mean that, that the nation itself doesn't have that duty first. In other words, it, is, it doesn't give you sort of carte blanche to just go around the world and you know, try to run the world. That's not the idea behind the Responsibility to Protect Doctrine, because the first duty is still in the hands of the nation state that is supposed to be governing the country. 
But if you've got a country that is crushing its own citizens the way Iran is doing, uh, then you do have a responsibility, an international responsibility, to get involved in the situation. There's another principle that I'd like to leave you with, and that is something Ellie Richter and I, who is an epidemiologist who works at the uh, Inter Institute for the Holocaust and Genocide in Jerusalem, uh, and I call the precautionary principle. It, it's a term that actually comes out of epidemiology, out of health, uh, you know, health uh, campaigns. Suppose you have evidence that a bird flu epidemic is about to break out, and you've got birds that are sitting in Hong Kong. <coughs> and you know that if this bird flu epidemic somehow spreads outside of Hong Kong, it is going to be a total global disaster. What do you do? Well, some people would say, well, wait a little bit and make sure that you, you know, you're not kind of overreacting. And in fact, uh, so wait, wait just a little bit. And Elihu Richter says, no, that is not the point of view of, uh, of epidemiologists and uh, of preventive health uh, workers. The precautionary principle says, once you know that a catastrophe would be so bad that it could truly have catastrophic implications far beyond what you know, would happen if it didn't happen. Then the burden of proof shifts to those who say the catastrophe won't happen. You get my point? The default position of most diplomats is do nothing. I can tell you that because I work in the State Department. <coughs> do nothing. Well, if you've got genocide, the default position should be do everything you can to stop it. And that means you really use every diplomatic tool you've got. It means you really go, you take it seriously. Uh, and that's basically what we're arguing needs to be done with Iran. Um, now, one way, I don't think it's very likely, not likely at all. But it's a possibility, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a way to think about it. One thing that is possible is that a nation that is a party to the Genocide Convention that doesn't have a reservation on Article 9 jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice. Article 9 jurisdiction is the mandatory jurisdiction uh, in which parties that sign up for it say, anytime there's a a, a debate about whether genocide's going on, you can haul us in to the world court and uh, we'll have to answer for it. That is a, an article on which we have a reservation in the U.S., so we couldn't do it because there's a reciprocity principle in international law, but there are a lot of countries that haven't got that reservation, Canada being one, uh, a whole lot of European countries being others. They could literally bring a case in the International Court of Justice against Iran for incitement to genocide to the International Court of Justice. And there wouldn't be a damn thing that Iran could do to stop it. So, I mean, I personally think that wouldn't be a bad idea. Um, and then, of course, finally, I mean, I think that we need to be ready. Uh, John Kennedy um, uh, concluded uh, that his father had been wrong to be an isolationist in the 30s. His father was the ambassador to uh, Great Britain, and he lived with his father in Great Britain during the Blitz. And uh, he and his father realized they had been wrong. And that's one reason he wrote this senior thesis. Uh, why England slept. It's, on, it's available online, I recommend it. Not hard to read. He's, he was a hell of a good writer even when he was a senior in Harvard. Uh, Iran is the only country that 
since Nazi Germany that's openly expressed its genocidal intent to wipe another nation off the map. That is amazing. The country most likely to be blackmailed by and Iran with nuclear weapons is Israel. No question about it. So we have got to think, what are we going to do? My own view is we have got to essentially take Israel under our nuclear umbrella. Under our nuclear umbrella. We have got to tell Iran, if you attack Israel with nuclear weapons in a first strike, we will blow you off the face of the planet. In other words, it's mutual assured destruction. It's the old, old Cold War doctrine. It's, you know, in great disrepute now, everybody says, oh my God, how can you believe that? But you know what? It kept us from getting into the nuclear war with the Soviet Union. And I'm convinced we need to assert it now with Iran about Israel. With that lighthearted thought, I <laughs> 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 Thank you very much for your, your presentation and all of your work. It's, uh, it was an amazing presentation, and I think to hear a pin drop for over an hour. So thank you. And uh, I'm going to take the prerogative and lead off the question. Um, I'm going to start backwards. I think mutual, mutual assured destruction presupposes many things. The, the Soviets, the socialists, communists, and capitalists are all materialists. And they're all about transforming the environment and resources and producing wealth. And the, the only argument is how they how to distribute it or redistribute it. The Iranian regime and Islamism, not Islam and not Muslims, but Islamism, has one foot in the material world. They're very much uh, about creating wealth and developing their society. And they also have a foot in the metaphysical world. Uh, and that world, in the world to come, uh, Mutual assured destruction never dealt with this issue. So I'm not sure if we have to wait until they get a nuclear weapon. Hillary, Hillary Clinton, um, that was her policy, that if uh, Iran does anything to Israel, they'll blow it, Iran off the face of the earth. But uh, what, you know, so what? Uh, it, it doesn't defend Israel, and then to have another extermination of another group of people would be another tragedy. So that's one point. But my question is this. You, you spoke very eloquently about the Iranian regime and my comp. Um, I am into social theory and ideology. And the ideology of the Iranian regime and of Islamism is that <coughs> Muslims must have self-determination over Islamic land. And the only, <coughs> the only non-Muslim to have self-determination over so-called Islamic land are Jews through the state of Israel. And it's, it's incompatible with Islamism. That has to stop. So the rhetoric of genocide I take also extraordinarily seriously because it's rooted in the worldview. This is a, something that needs to stop. And it's not only Islamic land, it's, it's, it's holy Islamic land um, in, in Israel, Palestine. So they use the dehumanization. They're using the protocols of the elders of Zion. They're taking European genocidal anti-Semitism and mastering it. It's, it's the narrative that Ahmadinejad speaks about. He was on. American TV, night after night, a few weeks ago when he was here, using the narrative of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, the sort of small clique of Jews, a secret group that have now infiltrated and, and controls the United States. It, it somehow, uh, this clique, this uh, group of people actually blew up the World Trade Center and, and, and so on and so forth. Yeah, it's amazing. And, and he has a world stage. He, he said it again at the United Nations. He said it on Larry King and all, all the media outlets. And the thing is that we don't speak this language. Obama was outraged that uh, he spoke near ground zero about the World Trade Center being an American uh, job. But nobody speaks to the elephant in the room that this narrative of the protocols of the elders of Zion, this, this dehumanizing text, goes on unchallenged. That's number one. Number two, people who are studying anti-Semitism, people who are studying contemporary anti-Semitism and want to take a stand against this uh, very real danger, not just to the Jews, but to the to the world. 
liberals, in quotations, pacifists, are now, I would say, dehumanizing and accusing people like Alan Dershowitz or Wayne Kotler, conservative and liberal intellectuals, as being warmongers, as silencing freedom of debate and free speech, as not being intellectually honest, not being scholars, but being politicians. And this is what keeps me at the I understand the Iranians. I understand their worldview. I understand Hezbollah and Hamas. I understand what they're trying to achieve. They're very clear. They're very honest. But what is happening to the Americans? And why this hypocrisy? Why this inability to take a stand? Judith Butler, a genius, a professor of rhetoric studies at Berkeley, California, graduate of Yale, is going around the world speaking about Hamas and Hezbollah should be perceived as being a part of the progressive left. She's a, she's a Jewish Orthodox woman and a gay rights activist, a progressive, very intelligent, well-read scholar. What is happening? And how to, how to confront or how to deal with this tension in the academy? Well, there's so many questions you just Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to think. Uh, let's see. What is number one and two and three and four and five? I'm sorry. Uh, no, you it's okay. What you want Actually, to no, it's, these, these are not... I, actually, I prefer discussion as much as questions, because I'm not sure I have the answers to all of these things. I think it'd be good to get more, maybe, sure. discussion in the group of some of these uh, issues. Uh, I've had the same experience with uh, Sarah Lee Whitman and Human Rights Watch. I mean, you know, she studied at uh, the American University in Cairo. She speaks fluent Arabic. She's the Middle East expert for Human Rights Watch. And she calls me up and she says, what is it with you and Iran? And I, says, uh, I said, Sarah, look, I mean, I've had you down at my university to speak. I said, I, you and I just don't see the world the same way, I guess, about the danger of that regime. And, and, uh, you know, and don't you know, she says, uh, that it was uh, mistranslated what he said. And I said, no, he wasn't. And, you know, that kind of thing. I mean, um, so I think you're absolutely right, though, that scholarship, scholars, need to be really careful, you need to do it right. And what I like about this work by the Institute for uh, Holocaust and Genocide in uh, Jerusalem is they are doing it right. You know, they really are putting those quotes exactly together. I mean, they're not just making broad, you know, generalizations. They've got the facts. Um, and um, to me, that's a huge help in, in the debate. As far as this is about whether Islamism, uh, you know, is otherworldly, and um, and I know you've got a point there, because, I mean, that's how they got all these these suicide bombers to go uh, across the minefields, uh, you know, during the Iran-Iraq war. Martyrs, right, exactly, martyrs. I don't know, I suppose you had the same kind of attitudes among some of the crusaders, I don't know. Uh, but um, it, it's, it, it is a hard one to, to, to deal with. I, I would agree with you about that. Um, maybe the, um, the answer is to, to find ways to convince these young people that martyrdom, in fact, or in which you take out the lives of other innocent people, children, women, etc., as many terrorists do, uh, is not martyrdom at all, it's murder. And it won't send you to heaven at all. It'll send you to the other place. Uh, but uh, that would take, actually, a bakwa from somebody like uh, one of the high ayatollahs, and I don't know whether they're ready to do that. I would like to make two comments. It is principle of mutual assured destruction is being employed by a group of people who takes the statement never again seriously, which is by the state of Israel. Israel has a fleet of conventional submarines 
which are, by the way, the German made dolphin class, which otherwise they are uh, diesel powered and not atomic powered, but the Mediterranean is smaller. They keep the, uh, these are missile for, uh, shooting submarines. And they are essentially, either the preparatory stage, they now bought one or two new ones from Germany. And they will be because first strike can hit land-based <coughs> missiles, but cannot find submarines. So Israel, don't ask the Israeli general staff about this because you will not get an answer. But Israel is essentially clearly planning this mutual assured destruction <coughs> for the time when, unfortunately, Iran apparently will have nuclear weapons. Now, a second point which is connected, and which is connected to what you told about a president, sorry, Councillor in Merkel, it's very nice what she said, but you may be aware that Germany is the greatest trader with Iran. And, uh, and now, when the sanctions have been uh, imposed, they have restrained it somehow. And actually, there was pressure on German companies, for instance, on Siemens. I don't know if you know, but Siemens makes many what is called light trains. And they essentially won the competition for installing a light train network in Los Angeles. But because the Los Angeles Jewish community had been made aware about the great contribution of Siemens in Germany. They, they canceled the city of Los Angeles because of that pressure, canceled that contract with Siemens, which was a pretty penny, you can imagine. And uh, <coughs> since then, Siemens also slowly but did restrict seriously their trade. Also, they are still supporting things they have sold. What they have sold is unfortunately very damaging for other things. They, with Nokia, have implemented this uh, system which prevented citizens of Iran to phone undetected from Iran on cell phones and inform what's happening. And this is during those protests about a year ago after the election. And this is the proud names of Siemens and Nokia. Now other German companies have provided to Iran machines for tunneling, which helps them build those uh, underground uh, nuclear uh, uh, installation systems, which are clearly offensive. So it's very nice what Mrs. Merkel said, and it's also very nice that Germany does send the Dolphin submarines to Israel. But uh, this enormous trade, industrial trade of Germany with Iran, is a different story. So Thank you. That's very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to. Uh,
continue the discussion on, about what to do. Um, and I think that your stages of the development of genocide were created so that we could help guide us exactly. about what to do at different stages. Yeah. And one of them, you said, was the destruction of the moderate voice. Yeah. Or this, this empowering of the moderate voice, which would suggest that if one could re-empower the moderate voice, that might be among the list of things to consider that we might do. I completely agree. So then the question would be, in the spirit of discussion, how might one do that in this geopolitical situation? And one of the things that has been suggested that is problematic for moderate voices within the Islamic world, the that we're talking about, internal moderate voices is where you're talking about that. One of the things that's been suggested as being problematic for the modern voice in the Islamic world is the continuing Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And that if that were resolved in a way that was seen as reasonable to most Palestinians and to much of the moderate uh, Islamic world, that that would then enable that uh, voice to speak about other things in, in other ways. So uh, the first question for you is, do you think that there's some truth in that. And then if there is, because what you've constructed for us is a very high cost alternative. And in this prevention model, the epidemiology model, a lot of things would be worth sacrificing if you thought what was at stake was the genocide that you're talking about. And you're convincing us that there's a real and present danger of the genocide. That might make other trade-offs seem different than we might have thought before. And that might change the way we actually would think if we were trying to represent the interests of Jewish people or preventing the genocide in terms of what trade-offs should be made to resolve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict if you thought that that resolution was going to enable the moderate voice to deal with a much worse problem as you're presenting it today. So, I mean, that's an argument that's not hard to construct logically and which is certainly out there. And I'm asking, I'm wondering about your assessment of that view. No, I think you're right on both points. I mean, I think if we were able to um, achieve uh, some kind of uh, agreement between Palestinians and Israelis, uh, it would have a huge impact on the entire picture. The entire picture. Uh, and the other thing is, uh, and this was, this actually, I was tipped off to this, to uh, this, other element of empowering the moderate voices in Iran um, um, by a statement that Ahmadinejad himself made in one of his interviews with somebody on TV. Uh, this guy is not dumb. Nobody should ever think he is. Uh, he said, we are being attacked by, um, and then he named some of the main supporters of the um, the people who trained the Akpor activists who overthrew Milosevic in Yugoslavia. Those very same people. He knew their names. And he's right. Because in fact, Iranian moderates have been uh, given training by some of these folks. Uh, uh, there's, there's a... Uh, an expert on nonviolent resistance who's been very involved in it. Uh, George Soros uh, has given money to support it yeah. and so forth. Amani Jad knew the whole thing. He knew their names. He knew they were after him. And of course, my view on that is do it openly. Don't need to do it secretly. I mean, hey, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, that was why we did it in Ukraine, I can tell you. Um, we shipped in literally thousands of fax machines, and the Soviets didn't know what to do about it. Seriously, it completely revolutionized the struggle in there because all of a sudden we could, you know, uh, have um, essentially um, uh, encrypted uh, <laughs> transmissions between all kinds of people in the root movement that the KGB couldn't decipher. You know, <laughs> and so it was. It was really quite an extraordinary uh, development, but and, and it was largely funded by uh, 
you know, people back in the uh, United States and Canada who were in the uh, Ukrainian diaspora. A lot of times the diasporas uh, of these groups uh, can have enormous impact. They speak the language already, and I mean, that was the case. So I would agree with you. I think that is huge, could make a huge uh, contribution. As the clock ticks, and given the UN's 50-year history of anti-Israel proclamations, <coughs> I think it's highly unlikely that the UN is going to stand up in support of Israel in this situation. So my question is, is it likely, in your estimation, that Israel will take preemptive action? I don't know. I really don't. I mean, I, I just don't. I, I'm not, uh, you know, I, I left the State Department, so I don't have uh, top secret uh, code word clearance anymore. Uh, but, um, so I don't know the latest intelligence on this. Uh, clearly, there must be, a, there, there's a debate going on in Israel about it. The, uh, the downside of it um, could be um, so uh, ferocious that, that I'm wondering if Israel would want to take that chance. Given the fact, as the gentleman has pointed out, that Israel now has atomic weapons positioned in submarines off its coast, and that there is no way Iran could take it out its nuclear um, capabilities. I mean, I think it's one of the reasons we uh, put nuclear, whistle, nuclear missiles on submarines also in the United States to keep mad alive, <laughs> as it were. Um, I take it, there's a yeah. question here then. There, there's Charlie. Hey, Greg. Um, this, by the way, is the man who got me started in all of this. He was my friend in law school, and he was the first person who gave us money to start Genocide Watch and the Cambodian Genocide Project. And we're still living on that money, I want you to know. <laughs> <laughs> it's the best investment I've ever made. It's true, I've gone great for 40 years, and uh, I love him like a brother. But I guess I want to challenge you uh, on, on the, your logic, because I see this as a, as a, as a political issue. I happen to think that if we could figure out a way to deal with the political issue of the land in the, in the Middle East, uh, that would just eliminate uh, all of this. Right now, the way Iran is working, it, it's, it's arming Semitic groups, Hezbollah and Hamas. They're Semites. I mean, this is, this is Esau and Jacob. It's been going on for thousands of years. And they're just picking favorites. They'd rather see Esau win than Jacob. You know, that's, and, uh, but in fact, meanwhile, inside Iran, I mean, where the, sometimes the logic falls out is that, they, that in fact, there's been a vital Jewish community in, in Iran for 2,000 years. Uh, one of the most prestigious hospitals in, in, in Tehran is run by Jews. Uh, it, Jews are under the, the Iranian constitution, just like um, Armenians, are guaranteed a seat in the Iranian parliament. You know, so this is a political issue. Uh, and when you equate uh, why not wanting to wipe a state or a nation off the map, which is horrendous, it's awful, it's despicable, but it's not genocide because it's political. <laughs> and you know as well as I do that political battles are exempt from the genocide. I mean, this is not about Jews, this is about Israel. You can't equate, in my opinion, you can't equate uh, uh, the two. And that's what you're doing, and I think that's the flaw, frankly, in your in your logic. Well, I would agree with you that it's political. I have no doubt about that, and I think you're right with it, Charlie. But understand this, that, it, that the definition of genocide, as you know, is the intentional destruction uh, in whole or in part of a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group. And so if, the, if, if, your, if your intent is to destroy a national group, and I think that's what they're planning to do, namely Israel, that is genocide. So in other words, I think I, won't, I don't think it, it will get us very far to argue about whether it's political or 
you know, or not, because I really do agree with you, actually. I mean, I think that the, a political solution is by far the best way to deal with this. Yeah, Israel and Jacob have to figure it out. And if they do, then that's an end to that, that, that battle that's been going on for right. centuries. In my view. Anyway, you know, that's where I, so we, we can agree to disagree. Well, not only that, actually, I agree with you. Because, uh, I mean, he's the, he's the master of conflict resolution, believe me. <laughs> so, the, Professor Stadler, yeah. prof before Professor Stadler, I'm just going to make one point. I think that the, from my perspective, from the research that I've done, what I appreciate about the Iranian revolutionary regime and Hamas and Hezbollah is that they're straightforward, they're honest, they're open, and they use the term Israeli and Zionist and Jew interchangeably. I think if you go to Los Angeles or Long Island or other parts of the world, you'll find the uh, Iranian Jewish community alive and well. I'm wondering if our focus isn't too narrow, essentially in terms of Israel and Jews. There's a much greater struggle taking place between Islam and the West. And it's not necessarily political, it's a religious struggle. And uh, Rubenstein's book, in terms of jihad and genocide, points this out. Uh, Israel is essentially the canary in the mine. Uh, they're going to go first if they go, but it's a, an attack on the West. And if we don't see it as an attack on the West, we're losing the perspective on what's happening. We're seeing it essentially from the lens of Jews, and we've got to look at it in terms of the world lens, the Western lens. And what Charles Small pointed out, Dr. Small pointed out, is very relevant that we talk rationalists in, in terms of rational terms. And that's politics. But there's a religious struggle going on, and we have to cope with the religion. And the question is, how are we going to deal with the religious struggle between the jihadists, between the Islamists, and Western civilization? That's, that's a very good point. That's deep, because it is, again, that one goes back thousands of years, too. Uh, Uh, I would like to uh, express some reservation about the agreement that if the Palestinian situation uh, was settled, that it would defang the Iranians uh, and cause them to give up, <coughs> say, their drive to get atomic weapons. I don't think it would at all. Mm. I don't really think the Iranians, particularly deeply as to refer to historically care about the Palestinians. They're mostly Sunnis. And the Shiites in Iran don't really have much use for Sunnis. But Iran has great ambitions of ranging to <coughs> Pakistan, ranging to Syria, ranging to Arabia. So they're going to get atomic weapons, not really because of the Israeli thing. And this current president in Iran may talk about genocide and so on, but his successor may not. But his successor will be pursuing atomic weapons and using them as a threat to dominate the region, which is what they're all about. Because that's the question we're running after. And so uh, I, I'm really not asking a question. I'm expressing this a reservation a about an agreement up or around the table. It's actually a point that Tony Blair agreed with you about. I mean, they interviewed him about this. And he, they asked him, well, you know, if Iran gets nuclear weapons, what does it mean? And he said it'll completely change the balance of power in the Middle East. Right. So, I, 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 having been the one who articulated the position earlier, it's not the position that you were just summarized. I think you misunderstood the fundamental part of what I said, at least. So, in the spirit of discussion here, uh, Professor Stanton's model about how uh, um, genocide develops through the stages. A key element, he said, was the moderate voice within the community that is in a particularly important and strategic position to resist the extreme leadership is a very important uh, element. And if that moderate voice is disabled, then there is no internal resistance to the extreme leadership. I wasn't saying that if the Israeli-Palestinian conflict was resolved, that the current leaders of uh, Iran would change their position. That's not at all what I said. What I said was that the moderate opposition throughout the Islamic world, which is one of our potential allies, and given 
that we have so little other viable alternatives on the table, that seems like an ally that we would not want to disempower or disregard. And I don't think there's any question that that particular element would be strengthened or be freer to oppose the extreme views in its own communities if the Israeli-Palestinian conflict were resolved. I think that's a pretty straightforward fact. I don't think that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict can be solved until we deal with the Iranian question. Because until Ir Iran is defanged and until their fascist totalitarian leadership is eliminated, then Hamas and Hezbollah are strengthened and they have no interest in peace with Israel. So I think the road to peace between Israel and the Palestinians goes through Tehran and not vice versa. Both ways. Interesting. I think both ways. I, I don't think that there will be any peace possible between Iran and the Palestinians until the nuclear potential of Iran is off the table and Iran becomes a secular force for good in the region. Very interesting discussion. Any, any more questions? Yeah, yeah, I, I just want to uh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that uh, I think it should be both ways because uh, each one strengthens the other because uh, the Hezbollah gets uh, power for, and uh, Hamas gets power from uh, the Iranian and uh, we should act both ways but uh, any agreement will uh, weaken the, the path of the extremists in the Middle East and uh, help uh, create a coalition against Iran which is, uh, I think we should be the Professor Katz. Uh, I was interested in your first step with count people. I think you said classified. Classified classify <coughs> people. Well, we talked about Germany selling arms or potential arms to Iran. The IBM Corporation of this country during World War II sold the Nazis the machines and the cards to punch data that classify the Jews that were in all the concentration camps. So we are ashamed in this country as well. Yeah, it's a, a first-rate use of punch cards. I wanted to ask uh, Professor about um, the role of religious minorities in, in Iran and also how um, this this uh, system that or group of phases that you laid out is also very applicable to um, very many religious min or even groups that aren't religious minorities in Iran, just minorities in general. Um, is isn't this just as dangerous of a road to 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 look at? Um, I think with with Israel, at least Israel has the capability to strike back. Israel has nuclear weapons. That in, in the horrible case of, of of war, there would be a possibility. I think with religious minorities in Iran, there isn't this alternative. There's no. They are at the whim of of this fascist deterrence, as, as the gentleman says. So isn't this case a little bit more um, impertinent um, and something that we should focus on as well as well as the Israeli issue? Absolutely right. And I, that is actually a good point in general uh, for many of the countries in the Middle East. A lot of people forget about how diverse these countries are, actually, and how many minorities are in them. Uh, I mean, I've been, for instance, in parts of Iraq where you had at least seven or eight ethnic groups, you know, just within um, 50 miles. Uh, the Yazidis, for instance, the Kurds, uh, the, you know, the various and sundry groups in northern Iraq, uh, some of them Zoroastrians still. I mean, uh, you have the Chaldeans, you know, or the, some of the ancient Christians that still actually speak uh, 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 the language of uh, Jesus. I mean, it, it's amazing. Uh, and also, of course, as you just pointed out, in Iran, the Baha'is are very important group and have been persecuted. Um, and there are many, there are other groups as well. And yeah. when you said we could, there's the possibility for bringing Ahmadinejad to the uh, World Court um, for incitement of genocide, isn't this another avenue that the international community could take to um, kind of strike at the the the, the zone? You know, the most effective campaign on the uh, persecution of the Baha'is that was done 
was not to um, take it to any court or anything, but it was basically to embarrass the heck out of the uh, Islamic Republic for what they were doing to the Baha'is. Um, they took it to the UN and they really made a big deal out of it up in New York. And I know some of the people who led that campaign. Uh, and and to, the, to a great extent, the um, Iranian regime backed down uh, and released a lot of the Baha'i leaders. Um, they still are not at all tolerant of the Baha'is though. And um, so I think that the trouble, you know, one of the big problems that we faced and that um, when I was just a student here at Yale Law School, I uh, realized was um, in many ways we're still building um, the first institutions of international law. Um, you know, Nuremberg was sort of the last big genocide trial and when I took Merge in Damascus course on international criminal law, that was the last one. And there were no others. And so uh, what he said to us was, well, you'll have to go out and build them. And you know, that is a, that's a pretty empowering kind of a thing to say to a young law student, you know. But by golly, we have done it. Uh, you have to get yourself in the right position to do it, of course. And we were only a little way along. We've got it only for a few places, you know, like the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda and East Timor and Sierra Leone and now Cambodia and, and places like that. But we do have, thank God, we've got the International Criminal Court. 116 countries are now have ratified that treaty. Uh, to me, it's a great shame that the United States has not. But it's in our great interest that we ratify that treaty. Uh, we can only gain from it. There are provisions built into that treaty, the complementarity clause in particular, that give first crack at any criminal trial against somebody that's accused of war crimes or genocide or crimes against humanity to national courts. The truth is we have national courts that can handle that. The, ch the chances of an American ever being tried by the ICC are almost zero. So, I mean, we really should just ratify that thing. And I'm sort of hoping that some enlightened uh, conservative will come along and, you know, the way Reagan did finally for the genocide convention and say, why haven't we ratified this? Uh, and, and, you know, we can then, I think, uh, really use what I think is one of the most uh, uh, progressive developments in the field of international law. But to get Iran <laughs> Sudan, a lot of other countries uh, to become parties to the International Criminal Court. That'll take some time. So I just realized the time, and we're actually supposed to leave the building at 6 o'clock. <laughs> uh, and I guess, I guess one of the signs of a, of a great seminar is that if I can be interested, I know the questions can go on for hours. I'm sorry that I have to cut it. But